alive. Okay, we are live with Bill Hartung from the Arms and Security Project at the Center for International Policy. My name is Rita O'Connell. I'm Code Pink's Divest from the War Machine National Organizer. And um, well, it's been an interesting week, um, two weeks, a couple of years in American foreign policy. And we thought we'd bring Bill in to talk to us a little bit about um, what's been happening lately and what, well, what we have to look forward to. Um, so for a starter, Bill, thank you for being with us. Yes, glad to be here. And can you just tell us a little bit about what the Arms and Security Project is and, and what you are, what you're up to at the Center for International Policy? Uh, yeah, uh, my project provides information to uh, journalists, the Hill, activists about uh, Pentagon spending and the global arms trade and uh, nuclear policy, uh, trying to generate a better debate, better informed, and also reduce militarism, nuclear weaponry, Pentagon spending, and so forth. So uh, we're a progressive think tank. We work on some other issues. We have a Mexico project. We have a Cuba project. We work on the environment. Uh, and we have a project looking at um, foreign influence over US foreign policy. Uh, and we've been around since the 70s. It was founded by combination of uh, anti-war activists and diplomats who had resigned over the Vietnam War. So uh, that's sort of the short version. Okay, and of course, um, you know, Code Pink has has for some time relied on your expertise um, in terms of your work, particularly aimed at promoting reforms in American um, military policy, military spending and the arms trade. Um, you were a speaker at the launch of our Divest from the War Machine campaign summit in October. Um, so we um, are grateful for the work that you do and uh, let's get down to business on what's going on in the world today. Uh, Trump was in Brussels last week at the NATO summit. Um, what, what happened, Bill? Well, you know, Trump obviously insulted everybody possible. Uh, but I think, you know, the thing that interested me was, uh, you know, there was this whole debate about uh, NATO countries not meeting their commitment to spend 2% uh, of their gross domestic product on their militaries. Uh, the United States spends more than that. And Trump wanted them. First, he said 2%. Then he said, oh, why not 4%, which would be an absurd level. They'd be more than doubling it in a short period of time. Uh, but there wasn't much discussion of the fact that NATO already outspends Russia by a huge margin. Um, NATO countries uh, spend about $900 billion a year. So pushing a trillion dollars on their militaries combined, Russia spends about 66 billion. So it's about 13 times as much that NATO spends as Russia. So whatever people think about Putin's relationship to Trump and you know the, the whole hubbub over that, uh, the idea that we need to spend more money on NATO is ludicrous, uh, especially if you consider a lot of the NATO spending uh, is spent outside of Europe, NATO countries fighting in Afghanistan, uh, in the Iraq war under Bush and, and following on. So uh, even the concept that NATO is uh, to defend Europe has been corrupted in some ways. And NATO's become a kind of a stepchild to US global uh, military aspirations. So, um, you know, that was one takeaway. And, you know, I've written about it, but it certainly hasn't been discussed uh, widely. And I think now that Trump is a little performance in Helsinki, it's gonna take a lot of important issues off the table and we're gonna have to put them back on. And, and what's the international response? What, what do the other members of NATO say to this idea of increasing military spending? Well, they've said they'll meet those commitments to get up to 2%. They haven't been in a rush to do it. Uh, I think it's because they have other priorities. Uh, you know, Europe has a better social safety net than we do. They're closer to Russia and apparently they don't feel as threatened as some of our members of Congress and others do because if they really thought it was an existential threat, they would be spending the money. So, um, you yeah, know, they, they've given uh, verbal commitments, but um, they've said this for many years. I don't expect huge increases, except perhaps in some of the East and Central European uh, countries. 
Sure. And of course, uh, the increase of defense and military spending is not just a conversation Trump likes to have on the international stage. It's something that he has brought um, to the domestic scene since the beginning of his presidency. What have we seen in the last two years um, under under Trump? What what has changed or um, stayed the same in, in military industrial spending in, in our country? Well, Trump uh, proposed a big increase, about $54 billion when he first came in, uh, about you know 10% uh, more or less increase. And then Congress said, oh, no, that's not enough. And so they added tens of billions of dollars more. And so now we're spending one of the highest levels since World War II, uh, $716 a billion dollars in the upcoming budget. Uh, in the meantime, many other programs from diplomacy to the environment, to nutrition, to housing have been uh, cut significantly. And the uh, Poor People's Campaign, which uh, Reverend William Barber organized, uh, which is trying to build on the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King's fight in the 60s, uh, has done an analysis of where we stand in terms of our commitments to fighting poverty and Institute for Policy Studies did some analysis for them. And what they found was uh, we spend, you know, three to four times on the Pentagon what we spend on fighting poverty. And that includes everything from housing to job training to nutrition uh, to education spending uh, to certain for, uh, forms of infrastructure to low income heating for people who might otherwise freeze in the winter. So it's a huge range of projects. And actually, if we scaled back the Pentagon budget to what it was before 911, we could double that, all those programs. So, uh, you know, we're, we're paying a big domestic cost. And Trump, uh, to the contrary, says, oh, no, it's good for jobs. Uh, he says that about the Pentagon budget. He says that about arms sales to Saudi Arabia. He says it whenever possible. And in fact, uh, almost any other form of spending creates more jobs than the Pentagon. Um, one and a half, two times as many jobs for things like alternative energy or education or healthcare. So um, he's taking us down the wrong road, uh, but he's busy bragging about what a wonderful job he's doing. And I think he may be pulling the wool over some people's eyes, but I think that's gonna change because the consequences are coming home now. And so you can't really ignore the priorities that he's pushing. Yeah, from some of your own writing recently, you point out that um, this the, the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 um, takes us to levels of military spending that are higher than we were spending during Korea, higher than during Vietnam, higher than during the Cold War, um, second only to the heights we were reaching um, at, the, at the height of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, and I, you, you point out at one point, you say for this $80 billion increase that we're looking ahead to in 2019, you could buy LinkedIn, Pinterest, Snapchat, and Twitter. So we're talking about an enormous amount of money. For what? If it's not creating jobs and it's not making us safer, which I assume it is not, um, what's the, how, how, how is he getting this by? What's the justification that's, that seems to be working? Well, there's still a belief in Washington, in, in both parties, I think, that the US should be a global military power, should be able to intervene almost anywhere on short notice, and that this is sort of a form of, uh, you know, keeping a certain kind of world order. Uh, in fact, as we've seen from Iraq and Afghanistan and many other places, our support for the Saudis war in Yemen, uh, most of our military activities of recent times have not only failed, but they've had huge human consequences. Uh, you know, the cost of war project that Brown uh, says we've spent $5.6 trillion on the post 9 Mormon wars. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have died, many of them civilians, uh, thousands of US troops, tens of thousands of more with uh, traumatic brain injuries and uh, various other kinds of uh, wounds. So it's, it's taking a toll on our veterans, it's taking a toll on people around the world. Uh, it's not really defending anybody. I mean, Iraq is worse off security wise than before George Bush invaded. Um, the disruption caused in the country, the bringing the power of a sectarian government, all made it easier for ISIS to get up and running. Um, so I don't think anybody would say, oh, you know, gee, invading Iraq was good for our security, except maybe a, a few dead enders in the neoconservative side. Uh, so yeah, so the, really that global military presence with hundreds of military bases, uh, we've sent special forces to over 100 countries in the last year. 
Uh, we sell weapons to well over 100 countries. So it's this whole kind of arms sales, military bases, global uh, troop and deployments, uh, worldwide Navy, and, and then, um, you know, perhaps worse, although the, there's, these are all negative consequences in many ways, uh, the big nuclear weapons buildup, uh, which started over Obama and which Trump would like to accelerate. Uh, and it'll be uh, new ballistic missile submarines, new land-based missiles, new bombers, new warheads, and it would cost, uh, some people say, um, up to $1.7 trillion over the next 30 years. So, I mean, if you took an actual look at, well, what do you need to defend the country? It would be easily a couple hundred billion dollars less than what's being spent. And in fact, we need a whole new approach because many of the biggest things that challenge us and threaten us are not military. You know, they're climate change, they're epidemics of disease. Uh, terrorism is not primarily gonna be solved through a big military force. Uh, so we, we would have to reconceive our whole approach to security. And once we had done that, then we could say, well, what, what do we need for the Pentagon? But instead, the Pentagon's kind of driving the train and everything else uh, is being left behind. Sure. And we're talking about global crises, climate change, the refugee crisis, things that are made demonstrably significantly worse by the presence of such a massive military machine. Um, if you're just joining us on Facebook Live, my name is Rita O'Connell. I'm the national organizer with Code Pink's Divest from the War Machine campaign. And we're talking with Bill Hartung, who is the director of the Arms and Security Project at the Center for International Policy. Bill, you mentioned um, Saudi Arabia and, and the Saudi-led coalition that has um, created and, and is continuing to worsen what has been called the absolute worst humanitarian crisis in the world in Yemen. Um, can you walk us through a little bit um, our relationship to the Saudi coalition and, and the arms deals there? Obviously, we had a, um, a visit from the Saudi Arabians earlier this year. Um, what does that relationship look like under Trump? Well, it was already a strong relationship under Obama, even though they disagreed about things like the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, Obama administration offered $115 billion of weapons to Saudi Arabia over the lifetime of the two terms of the administration. Now, at the end, he started having second thoughts and under pressure from human rights activists and others, he suspended a sale of precision guided munitions, bombs that were going to be used in the war. Uh, and the Saudis, since they started the war, have killed uh, you know, thousands of civilians in airstrikes on hospitals and marketplaces and weddings and funerals. Virtually anywhere that people gather, uh, they've, they've hit with a bomb. They've also bombed the infrastructure, including water treatment plants, which has led to a cholera outbreak. Uh, they put a blockade on the country, which makes it hard to get uh, food and medicine in. So uh, you know, millions of people in Yemen are at risk of famine, can't get basic medical care, uh, which is why, as you said, it's uh, you know the worst humanitarian catastrophe we, we see at the moment alongside, of course, what's happening in Syria. And so, um, you know, the United States is the main arms supplier to the Saudis, the planes they're using, the bombs they're using, the attack helicopters they're using are made in the USA. Uh, the US also uh, refuels uh, Saudi jets so that they can do more bombing runs. Uh, there's US personnel in the targeting centers where they pick targets and they claim it's to help the Saudis you know, make the right choices and avoid civilians and so forth. But that clearly hasn't happened uh, if you look at the, the record of, of carnage of civilians based on the Saudi bombing. And so Donald Trump has actually intensified the Saudi-US relationship. He's embraced the new crown prince who's, uh, you know, uh, reckless and is basically engaging in, in war crimes in Yemen. Um, and it's partly because they flattered him. They threw a big party for him over there. Uh, it's partly because Jared Kushner is tight with the crown prince. There's been outreach to the Trump camp well before he was elected president. Uh, also, the United Arab Emirates has thrown a lot of money around. They're also involved on the Saudi side of the war. They have a big lobby here. They've even reached out to... Um, people with close connections and uh, to Trump, like one of his top fundraisers to try to further push the US into the Saudi UAE camp in terms of things like opposing the government in Qatar because uh, Qatar isn't enough in the anti-Iran uh, campaign that uh, the Saudis are pushing. So it's one of the more dangerous relationships we have. Uh, I, would, I would like for some of the uh, coverage and animus about his relationship with Putin 
to also be directed at the relationship with Saudi Arabia, because I think that relationship could very possibly get us into a war with Iran or elsewhere in the region. And so uh, we need to break those ties, uh, however possible, and especially um, stop the arms sales, of which there's a big deal in the works that uh, Senator Menendez has put a hold on for the moment because he's uh, concerned about the human rights impacts of these exports. But, um, you know, so Trump has made a bad situation worse in terms of relations with Saudi Arabia and what's happening in Yemen. And the UN is, uh, you know, furiously trying to um, develop some sort of peace process, which is kind of um, racing against the clock with some of the actions of the Saudis and the UAE backed by the United States. Sure. And I feel like we're dancing a little bit around the elephant in the room, which is we've talked about money. We've talked about the, the enormous increase in, in profits and in weapon sales. We've talked about jobs. So um, there's this other player in the room, right? And that's the American corporate uh, weapons manufacturers. That's the private companies um, who are actually making and selling these bombs. So when we talk about the amount of um, defense spending increasing uh, by such historic rates, Really, where is that money going, Bill? Well, the corporations like Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman um, and Boeing, uh, the top five, um, get about $100 billion a year from the Pentagon uh, you know, combined. And uh, close to half the Pentagon budget goes straight back out the door to private companies. And you've got private contractors, uh, hundreds of thousands of them working for the Pentagon uh, close to the same number of people, government personnel who work there, and they do all manner of things. So some of them, you know, carry guns. Some of them are involved in various kinds of bureaucracy at the Pentagon. Some of them analyze intelligence and pass it up the line to the president and so forth. So, um, you know, in one way, the Pentagon budget is a big slush fund for corporations, uh, and some of it is is really, I think, can be thought of as blood money. I mean, if you look at Raytheon. Uh, which whose bombs have been found at the sites of uh, strikes on civilians in Yemen, um, you know they have responsibility for what happens with those weapons, even though they try to hide behind the idea that um, you know we're just doing what the government lets us do. They in fact are busy daily trying to influence what the government lets them do, and, and they have uh, you know the industry as a whole has anywhere from 700 to 1,000 lobbyists in a given year, which is almost two for every member of Congress. Uh, so they're doing everything they can to keep the money flowing. Uh, and they've got a willing partner in Trump. Uh, and they didn't do poorly under Obama either, even though he took a lot of flack for not spending more. I mean, the Pentagon always wants more, but uh, we were at quite high levels even under Obama. And we even hit the uh, post-World War II peak during the Obama administration. So, uh, you know, regardless of who's in power, uh, you know, their job more so than defending us is really uh, putting more money in their own pockets. And you talk a lot about the, um, you know, not not just the fact that this money is going from our governments to private corporations, but also the amount of waste and duplication of effort that's represented in there. 600,000 military contractors who are essentially replicating jobs that are already being done by government employees, right? Exactly. And, the uh, you know, the uh, Pentagon has so many of these contractors, they can't really keep track of them. They can't give you a precise number. Um, there was also a internal report that they commissioned uh, by this thing called the Defense Business Board. And they found uh, just in bureaucracy alone, the Pentagon's gonna waste 125 billion over the next five years. Uh, there's things like, you know, $1,200 coffee cups for use on aircraft. And, you know, so there's, there's a lot of waste thrown in there. And the thing about the waste is, it doesn't matter to the companies. I mean, if they're overcharging, that just means they make even more money. So uh, it serves yeah. their interest, but it doesn't serve anybody else's interest. Yeah, the thing that kills me about that $1,200 coffee cup conversation too is that those coffee cups break, the handles come off of them. So how you can get away with manufacturing a $1,200 coffee cup that doesn't actually work is entirely beyond me. So it really, really, really reaches levels of the absurd quite quickly, doesn't it? Well, um, it works as a profit center because they have to keep buying more. But otherwise, right, 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 absolutely, and and actually, that brings me to this question of um, somewhat relatedly the the revolving door between folks who work for these um, military contractors and our federal government, right? Um, what are, what are we looking at in terms of of um, people kind of moving in between those two worlds? 
Well, we don't have really as good a numbers as we used to, uh, but there's a lot of prominent examples. The project in government oversight is actually doing a database on this, which is gonna come out probably in the fall. Uh, but, but there's very prominent cases. I mean, uh, you know, Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, uh, was on the board of General Dynamics. Uh, John Kelly, uh, White House Chief of Staff, uh, worked for a defense contractor. Um, all up and down the line in the Pentagon, you've got people who worked for uh, Boeing and uh, Raytheon. Secretary of the Air Force did lobbying for Lockheed Martin. And you can go on. There's, there's dozens of examples we know of and, and probably many more. And so a couple of things happen when that goes on. First of all, the companies have even easier entree into the government because they've got former executives of theirs basically in control of the money that they want to get their hands on. Uh, but I, when you look at the other side of it, when people leave government to go to the corporations, uh, they're not really likely to drive a very hard bargain with these companies when they know they want a big fat job with them when they get out. So uh, some of this waste, uh, some of the kind of misdirection and bad contract decisions and so forth is probably attributable to that. You know, You've got people in there that they don't really want to push too hard against these companies because they're looking for a big payday when they leave the government. I want to make sure we leave time to move towards talking about solutions and, and some of the um, kind of dialogue based work that you do. But but before we do that, I, um, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about um, the, the contemporary acceleration of the nuclear arms race. And um, of course, you know, the, the doomsday clock is, has moved again and um, at, at a time when um, really we should be we should be doing nothing but de-escalating, we're doing exactly the opposite, right? So, so what's happening on the nuclear front and what should we all be keeping an eye on? Well, in addition to all the money that's being spent, which I mentioned, you know, the 1.7 trillion over 30 years, um, Trump has come in with some other bad ideas, you know, so he wants to build a, a smaller, lower yield nuclear weapon and their argument is, you know, only in Washington would this argument even be uh, put forward. Uh, but the notion is, well, nuclear weapons are for deterrence. And if you only have big ones, countries aren't going to believe you're going to use them. And then they're not, you know, deterred from doing things against your interests and safety. And so if you have smaller ones, which they think you might actually use, then they'll be more deterred. But actually, if you have smaller ones, they're more likely to be used. And so it's all, I mean, it's, it's you know, it makes your head spin when you think about kind of things these people argue to defend these things. But basically, the more nuclear weapons we have, the more likely they are to be used. And what does smaller nuclear weapons even mean? Well, I mean, they're still enough to kill many, many people. I mean, they would be larger, say, than the bomb that killed uh, hundreds of thousands in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So again, these, these terms are only in the Pentagon's world. I mean, in the real world, uh, these are deadly world-destroying weapons whether they call them small or large. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. So one of your um, stated uh, purposes at the at the Arms and Security Project is to spark a dialogue about the implications of the U.S.'s role as the world's number one arms exporting nation. So, what are the implications, and and how how are we doing on that dialogue? <laughs> well, there's a few areas where we've made progress on Yemen. Uh, you know, we got uh, 47 votes in the Senate to try to block a deal for precision guided munitions to Saudi Arabia. Uh, there was a Bernie Sanders, Mike Lee uh, amendment that would have cut off U.S. direct support, things like the refueling of the Saudi aircraft that got 44 votes. So in, in that kind of, you know, very huge crisis and through the work of a, a lot of non-governmental groups, at least it's on the agenda at least there's a chance to do something in Congress. There's another big sale coming up, uh, which we're hoping to be able to block. Um, but the broader problem of US arms sales has gotten much less attention. Um, you know, Trump has made it, uh, is gonna make it easier to do things like export firearms around the world. Um, he's gonna make every US uh, diplomat spend part of their time promoting US arms sales. Uh, again, he's bragging about the jobs impact. Uh, he's definitely, um, you know, uh, elevated this jobs and economic issue over things like human rights. So, uh, you know, he reversed the suspension of bombs to the Saudis. He stopped a suspension on sales to Bahrain because of its human rights abuses. 
likewise to Nigeria. Now in the firearm stuff, it's quite possible places like the Philippines and Turkey. Philippines has death squads sponsored by the government. Uh, Turkey has not only cracked down its own people, but has even attacked US citizens when the president was here. Um, Congress used to, was able to weigh in on some of those things. And under the Trump proposal uh, for firearm sales, Congress won't even be notified when they're happening. So they won't even have a handle uh, to raise their voices should they you know, choose to do so. So, um, you know, it's a global problem in the United States, uh, depending how you look at it in terms of weapons delivered every year, uh, probably has about a third of the global market in terms of new deals being made more like half. Uh, and of course, it's very hard to get other countries to stop doing this stuff when the United States is doing it on such a grand scale. Um, there's periodically, historically been efforts to limit the arms trade that have lasted for you know some periods of time. But um, I think it's one of the biggest unaddressed issues because it's, it's fueling conflict. And contrary to the Pentagon's arguments, it's probably more likely to get the United States involved in more wars, get drawn in on behalf of the countries uh, that it's supplying to, to fight these conflicts. So um, yeah, there is a decent network of groups uh, by our standards. I mean, obviously we don't have a lot of money we have millions of people up in arms about these things, but uh, there is a significant network of groups uh, working to rein in the arms trade. Uh, there's a group called Forum on the Arms Trade that's kind of an experts group. Um, there's many other organizations that have very specific issues like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty. Uh, there's groups like Friends Committee on National Legislation and others that weigh in on these important issues like the sales to Yemen. So, uh, you know, it's an uphill fight, but it's a fight I think we can have some victories in, and, and we have to. Uh, just and we have to. Yeah. 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 And so that's um, where I'd like to to end our conversation today. As I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, Bill was at um, Code, Pink's, Code Pink's launch of the Divest from the War Machine campaign and coalition in October of 2017. Um, that's now an 85 plus member national coalition of organizations who are engaged in one way or another in divesting from the war machine. It's a campaign that was designed to help um, individuals take a stand and take action in their own communities, at their institutions, with their congresspeople, um, and say, we have to stop making a killing on killing. We cannot continue to prop up the war machine in this way. Um, so we have a, a multi-pronged divestment campaign. We have tools for folks to engage with their congresspeople about not taking contributions from weapons manufacturers or the NRA. We have um, tools for people who, who, if you're an individual investor, um, we've recently rolled out a, a online database called Weapon Free Fund org and I'll throw that into the comments after this. Um, it's a way to see exactly where your mixed mutual funds or your exchange traded funds are invested. It breaks it down by conventional weapons manufacturers, by nuclear weapon manufacturers, even by civilian gun manufacturers. Um, so you can really see, which is increasingly hard to do in, in today's financial world, it really see where you're invested and where these companies are invested. Um, and then we have uh, an increasing number of institutional campaigns, folks who are going after their universities, after their cities, uh, after their pension funds, uh, demanding to know where those investments are and asking for them to be moved out of the war machine. And I know that when you were at the summit in October, um, Bill, you had some thoughts on some interesting or salient pressure points people might consider if they're going to develop one of these divestment campaigns. Can you give us a little bit of that? Well, I think, you know, probably the strongest hook we have is just linking these companies. Not only are they profiting, but the consequences. You know, so a company like Raytheon, whose bombs have been used to kill civilians in Yemen, where there's, you know, documented evidence, actually fragments of the bombs found at these sites. Uh, I think they are, are ripe targets. Uh, I think companies like Lockheed Martin, which gets $50 billion a year of our tax dollars, uh, certainly should be in our sites. Um, smaller companies like Honeywell, which runs a couple uh, nuclear weapons facilities, I think have to be certainly uh, looked at. And I think, um, you know, in addition to the money, I, I think it elevates the issue in the public debate. Uh, so that, for example, uh, more people will lean on Congress when they realize that a lot of this money is not defending us, it's just enriching these large uh, corporations. So, um, yeah, I, I think Code Pink is working on, you know, all the relevant fronts. And the more people we get behind it, the better. So I, you know, I commend you for doing that. Absolutely. And we couldn't do it without um, the work coming out of of the Arms and Security Project and um, all, you know, so, so many folks who are doing, there's just such a, a volume um, of, 
of military action to keep up with these days. That that most recent um, move from Trump about uh, reducing restrictions on firearms exports is, I just feel like astonishing and getting so little coverage. And so thanks to you and um, all the folks out there who are who are keeping an eye on this stuff and letting us know where we need to be putting pressure. Um, no way to do it without doing it together, right? Exactly. Well, anything, to, did we miss anything, Bill? Anything you wanna cover as an outro? I think we put enough on the table. Uh, I, I will say that um, it can seem overwhelming and people have to remember that we've won important victories through our activism before, um, getting rid of apartheid, uh, getting certain companies to get out of the nuclear weapons business, uh, passing a nuclear weapons ban at the United Nations, uh, having treaties against cluster munitions and landmines. And, you know, so uh, there's, a, if you look at it all kind of whizzing at you at once, you may feel like, well, what can I do? But in fact, we've done important things before and we can do them again. And, and the country's in motion uh, because of, in may, many ways, because of the Trump phenomenon, but a lot of the things people are fighting about uh, predate Trump. And so I think uh, you're gonna see people coming together on a lot of progressive issues. And I think this will be one of them. I think you're right. And, and thank you for the reminder about celebrating the victories. There's already quite a lot of movement um, right now in this divestment campaign. The city of Hollywood has passed a responsible banking policy um, that, that includes a screen for not investing in weapons manufacturers. Hampshire College um, developed an amazing, uh, sustainably responsible, uh, socially responsible investment policy. And that new fund, they, mo they moved their entire endowment into this um, responsible fund and it's outperforming their traditional fund to the tune of nearly two to one. So we have these amazing examples. And as you say, of course, there's tremendous work going on um, in the nuclear divestment um, realm with a, really quite a lot of, of energy there around nuclear free zones and um, cities who are increasingly stepping up and saying, um, you know, we, we, we won't be behind this, especially as the expansion of our nuclear um, nuclear fleet seems uh, imminent. And so th there is so much going on and there are so many places where people can plug in. Um, I promise wherever you're watching from, there is a campaign near you. You can email divest at codepink.org and we'll be happy to um, set you up with folks who are doing work in your area and, um, and we can get you going on um, how you can help divest from this massive war machine that we just learned a little bit more about today with the help of Bill Hartung. Thank you so much, Bill, for being with us. I think we should do this again sometime. Sure, thanks for hosting this. All right, take care, codepink.org. Thanks for being with us, everybody.